Hi everyone. In the second half of the 19th century, the Chilean Navy commissioned one of its most powerful warships, the ironclad Almirante Cochrane. Launched in 1874 and built in the United Kingdom alongside her sister ship Blanco in Calida, she stood at the heart of Chile's naval power during an era of fierce regional conflict. Named in honor of Thomas Cochrane, a legendary British naval officer and Chile's first vice admiral, the ship carried not just steel and guns, but a legacy of bold maritime leadership. Cochrane had played a vital role in Chile's War of Independence, commanding its fledgling navy with unmatched courage and tactical brilliance. The Almir anti Cochrane would go on to earn her own place in history, most notably at the Battle of Angamos, where she helped capture the Peruvian ironclad Huasca, decisively shifting the balance of naval power during the War of the Pacific. In this video, we'll explore the plans and design of this formidable warship and uncover the engineering behind one of the most iconic vessels of Chile's 19th century fleet. The story of the Chilean ironclad Almirante Cochrane begins in 1871, when Chilean President Federico E. Rosuris Zañata proposed a bold initiative to modernize the nation's navy. He introduced a bill to the Chilean Congress, authorizing the executive branch to acquire two armored warships. The bill passed with near-unanimous support, only a single vote opposed, and allocated a total of 2 million pesos for the purchase of two medium-sized ironclads. The Chilean ambassador to the United Kingdom, Alberto Blestgana, was entrusted with leading the project. To ensure the highest standards of naval engineering, Blestgana enlisted the expertise of Edward James Reed, a prominent British ship designer and former chief naval architect to the Royal Navy. The construction contract was awarded to Earl's Shipbuilding Company, located in Hull, Yorkshire. The two central battery ironclads were to be named Almirante Cochrane and Valparaiso. Construction of Almirante Cochrane began in April 1872. Due to rising tensions with neighboring Argentina and Bolivia, the ship was launched and sailed for Chile in 1874, before final completion. She arrived in the port of Valparaiso on December 26, 1874, under the command of Captain Cunin. Once her sister ship Valparaiso reached Chile, Cochrane returned to Britain in January 1877 to undergo final outfitting. The Almir anti Cochrane was a formidable ironclad designed to reflect the latest in maritime warfare technology. Measuring 64 meters in length, 14 meters in beam, and drawing 6 meters of water, the ship displaced up to 3,650 tons when fully loaded with fuel, water, ammunition, supplies, and crew. Her iron hull, reinforced with riveted plates and divided into eight watertight compartments by seven iron bulkheads, showcased the industrial engineering of the time. Like many warships of the late 19th century, Cochrane featured a sharp ram-style bow and a cruiser-style stern, combining offensive and hydrodynamic advantages. At the heart of her firepower was a central battery, housing six 9-inch Armstrong guns, mounted on a Scott centerline system. This allowed the forward gun to fire through a bow port, while the others covered a broad arc from bow to stern. Supplementing her main battery were several lighter weapons, a 20-pounder, a 9-pounder, a 7-pounder, and a 1-inch caliber Nordenfeldt machine gun mounted on a Kofa ratchet system, capable of firing 1-pound shells. Cochrane was also equipped with a steam-powered launch fitted with a spar torpedo, which saw limited use during an expedition to Callao, where it was employed in an attempt to sink Peruvian vessels. Protection came in the form of a comprehensive armor belt, extending 1.2 meters below the waterline and up to the top of the battery deck. This belt was 230 millimeters thick at midship, tapering to 115 millimeters at the bow and stern. Behind the armor lay 254 millimeters of teak, acting as a shock absorber. The upper battery was shielded with additional plating, 76 mm at the center, reducing to 50 mm fore and aft. 
The battery's front was further protected by two plates, 203 and 152 mm thick, while the rear armor reached 115 mm. Propelled by both steam and sail, Cochrane was rigged as a barkentine. Her propulsion system, provided by John Penn and Sons, included two steam engines, six cylindrical boilers, and twin screw propellers. Each engine featured a horizontal compound configuration with high and low pressure cylinders, producing a combined output of 2,920 horsepower, turning the propellers, each between 4 to 4.8 meters in diameter, at up to 90 revolutions per minute. This power plant enabled Cochrane to reach a top speed of 12.8 knots during trials. At full speed, she consumed 45 tons of coal per day, while cruising at 10 knots reduced consumption to around 35 tons per day. A balance of firepower, protection, and propulsion, Almir Anti Cochrane stood as a symbol of Chile's ambition to dominate the seas with cutting-edge naval engineering. As the War of the Pacific erupted in 1879, the Almir Anti Cochrane, one of Chile's most powerful ironclads, was thrust into action. Initially under the command of Captain Enrique Baez Simpson, the warship joined the Chilean Navy's efforts to impose a naval blockade on the Peruvian port of Iquique, beginning on April 5. By late June, Cochrane had become the flagship of Chile's second naval division, coordinating operations alongside the gunboat Magallanes, the corvette Aptau, and the transport Matias Cozino. After several months of active blockade duty, Cochrane was briefly withdrawn for maintenance in Valparaiso. It was during this time that command passed to Captain Juan José Latorre, a seasoned and resolute officer who would soon lead the ironclad into one of the most significant naval battles of the war. That decisive moment came on October 8, 1879, at the Battle of Angamos. Peru's most formidable vessel, the turreted Monotawasca, had been carrying out a daring and disruptive campaign along Chile's coastline, harassing shipping, breaking blockades, and evading superior Chilean forces for months under the skilled command of Admiral Miguel Grau. Determined to end the threat, the Chilean Navy devised a coordinated trap, splitting its fleet into two divisions to cut off Huasca's possible escape routes. Cochrane, under La Torre, was positioned to the north, while the Blanco in Calada, commanded by Galvarino Riveros, approached from the south. At dawn near Punto Angamos, the Chilean plan unfolded with precision. Cochrane opened fire first, striking Wasca with powerful 9-inch shells that battered her armored hull. The Peruvian monitor returned fire but was outgunned and outmaneuvered. The superior range, speed, and firepower of Cochrane and her sister ships quickly turned the tide. In the midst of the battle, Admiral Grau was killed by a direct hit to the conning tower, throwing the Wasca into disarray. Despite the crew's efforts to continue fighting, the Peruvian vessel suffered severe damage to her steering and propulsion. After an intense exchange lasting nearly an hour, and with the Chilean Blanco in Calada joining the attack, Wasca was finally disabled and boarded. The capture of Wasca was a turning point in the naval war. Not only did it remove Peru's most dangerous warship from the fight, but it also gave Chile control of the sea, allowing for unchallenged blockades, amphibious landings, and ultimately, the occupation of key coastal territories. After Angamos, Almir and he Cochrane remained active, participating in later operations, including the naval blockade of Arica in 1880, where she witnessed the Peruvian corvette Union make a daring breakout attempt. Through her role in the War of the Pacific, especially at Angamos, the Almir anti Cochrane cemented her place in history as one of the most important warships of her time, delivering a decisive blow that helped shape the outcome of the conflict. In 1878, as Chile faced a prolonged economic crisis, President Aníbal Pinto ordered the sale of the central battery ships, including the Cochrane. British and Russian buyers declined the offers made through intermediary E.J. Reed, and so the aging ironclads remained in service far longer than originally planned. Recognizing her historical value, 
the Navy eventually chose not to discard her. Between 1897 and 1900, Almir anti Cochrane was rebuilt as a gunnery and torpedo training ship, continuing to serve the Chilean Navy in a new capacity, no longer a war fighter, but a teacher of war. By the dawn of the 1890s, Almir anti Cochrane, though aging, remained a symbol of Chilean naval power. But her final chapter would not be written in distant seas, it would unfold in a conflict much closer to home. In 1891, Chile was plunged into a bitter civil war, pitting President José Manuel Balmaceda against congressional forces in a struggle for control of the nation. The Chilean Navy, including Almirante Cochrane, sided with the congressionalists, and once again, this ironclad would find herself at the heart of decisive action. On the evening of January 7, Almir and E. Cochrane performed a key logistical maneuver, towing the Monitor Wasca, which had been out of commission, from the Bay of Valparaiso to Las Salinas, where it was rearmed and readied for combat. This marked the beginning of naval preparations that would culminate months later in a dramatic battle. On August 23, 1891, Almir and E. Cochrane, alongside the protected cruiser Esmeralda under Jorge Mont, engaged Balmaceda's coastal defenses in Valparaiso. In the heated exchange that followed, Cochrane sustained between 10 and 12 direct hits, while Esmeralda was struck six to eight times. Despite the damage, the naval forces prevailed, striking a blow that contributed significantly to the Congressionalist victory and the eventual fall of Balmaceda's government. After decades of service that spanned two wars and a civil conflict, the venerable Cochrane was finally scrapped in 1934. Her legacy endures as a monument to Chile's emergence as a naval power in South America, a warship that fought with distinction, adapted to change, and remained in service long after many of her contemporaries had faded into history. Thanks for watching.